and here comes the senator. Hello. Hello, Senator Klobuchar. How are you today? I'm really, really good. <laughs> I've well, you know, had four hours sleep, but I didn't want to miss it. Oh, well, we, we so appreciate your time. It's, it's amazing that you were able to make time for us this morning. We, sure. we absolutely understand. Very good. So we're going to get ready uh, by first giving you a brief introduction. And I want to tell everyone on the call that if you have a question for the Senator, please add it to the chat box and we'll share your questions with the campaign. But a little bit about the Senator. Born in Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar graduated from Yale University and the University of Chicago Law School before she returned back to her state. She served as the Hennepin County Attorney for eight years and in 2006 became the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate in Minnesota's history. He's been reelected twice since. We want to thank her for her service in the Senate. We're following the impeachment trial really closely and we really appreciate your service to democracy and protecting it. We are, um, we are all up late last night with you too and just so <laughs> thrilled that you were able to join us today. So please take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Julia. And Thank you to Democrats abroad. You've always been uh, so friendly and good whenever I see you and have talked to me actually this uh, last few months about this call and I'm glad it, it worked. It is quite amusing we're doing it today, um, but it couldn't be more timely. And um, let me just start with that and give you a little recap of what happened last night. Um, we went until about two in the morning our time and um, the very last vote um, actually put in place this process that we're really concerned is not gonna result in any witnesses at all. I'm a former prosecutor and last time I checked, you have evidence and you have witnesses at a trial. We have zero witnesses, we have zero evidence and this has actually never happened in the history of America. And I was on the small group of senators involved in the last impeachment hearing of a judge uh, from Louisiana named Judge Porteous who had been involved in uh, taking money for uh, judicial decisions. And um, we literally had dozens of witnesses just for that trial and then we came back uh, to the full Senate. And so uh, the second to the last vote is probably the most interesting and just in case everyone didn't watch the whole time. But to me, it just said it all. Um, out of kind of desperation, we turned to a new idea, which was let's let Justice Roberts, John Roberts, decide the witnesses. Think about that. Republican appointed uh, Supreme Court justice. But we felt that, look, uh, he said he would call balls and strikes. That's a little from his, you know hearing and we thought, okay, let's let him do it. And they wouldn't do that. He would have then determined which witnesses were relevant. Obviously, John Bolton was relevant and Mick Mulvaney was relevant. And so that's what we're dealing with right now. To take it out from that, um, I really see that impeachment hearing, the one that I'm one of a hundred jurors in, um, as part of a bigger pattern and part of a bigger story. You guys are gonna be jurors too. Uh, you are jurors uh, in our election, and you are jurors in this primary coming up, um, but in a way they are all related, uh, because to me, while a lot of the issues we'll probably talk about um, on this video town hall, and a lot of the issues that we talk about on the debate stage are economic, I don't want us to forget that this election is also a patriotism check. It's a decency check, it's a values check. It is a president uh, that literally stood next to Vladimir Putin at the G20. And when a reporter asked him about interference in our election, he turned to him and made a joke. What I thought about, hundreds of thousands of Americans have lost their lives on the battlefield standing up for democracy. That's what World War II was about. Four little girls' innocence during the civil rights movement as we just celebrated Martin Luther King's legacy this weekend. Four little girls at a church in Birmingham, Alabama lost their lives at the height of the civil rights movement. Innocence. Just because people were trying to hold on to that democracy and expand it to them and others were trying to push it back. So many of our great moments and I think no one understands this better than maybe Democrats abroad because you see that deep history in whatever country you're in uh, so many of our moments, our great moments in America have been about democracy, about people trying to hold on to it and other people trying to push it away, good and bad moments. And this president makes a joke about it. So I just don't want us to forget that. And that kind of leads to me and my whole theory of the case here. 
um, and that is that uh, we need a candidate at the top of our ticket that will bring people with her instead of shutting them out. Uh, we need someone um, that knows how to bring in the voters that either stayed home uh, in 2016, and I have the track record of actually having the highest voter turnout every time I've led the ticket in my state in the country. Um, and that means a very fired up democratic base, including in our urban areas. Secondly, it means someone that can bring in independents and moderate Republicans, people in rural and suburban areas. And using examples for you, um, a, uh, a voter in uh, New Hampshire who was in a long line of people waiting to talk to me and they all had happy stickers on that said, I'm a climate change voter, I'm a reproductive rights voter, I'm a Supreme Court voter, and this guy just had this brown jacket on. And I um, came up to me and I said, sir, you don't have a sticker on. And he leaned over and he says, ah, that's because I was a Trump voter. And these are my neighbors. These are my neighbors. And they don't know. So don't say anything. He said, but I'm not doing it again. There are a lot of people um, that voted for Donald Trump because they felt, oh, you know, he's gonna keep promises. He's gonna build infrastructure. He's got a big building with his name on. He's gonna um, help me out. Um, and that just hasn't been the case. While he boasts about the stock market, uh, there has been far from shared prosperity. Uh, the tax bill that he passed actually really helped people at the top. That's why I went down to Mar-a-Lago and said, you just got a lot richer. So what I believe that we need to do in this country is number one, focus on the areas that we did not do well in. And if you think we can't win the Midwest, four words for you, former Governor Scott Walker. Uh, we won in states like Michigan with Gretchen Whitmer. We even won in Kansas, Laura Kelly, the governor's race. We just won in Kentucky and in Louisiana. Um, there are 31 counties in the state of Iowa that voted for, remember this if you remember nothing else, voted for Barack Obama and then went for Donald Trump. One of them I was just in voted for Barack Obama by 20 points. So what I believe that we need to do is first of all, um, define Donald Trump and make very clear uh, in a way that maybe isn't just about being a bully. That's not how a lot of them think of him. Um, it's also about the fact that he literally blames other people every time he's given a problem. When they're given a problem, they've just got to work harder. When he's given a problem, he blames other people. He, he blames Barack Obama. He blames the uh, head of the Federal Reserve. He blames the city of Baltimore. He blames one of my favorite for Democrats abroad, uh, the entire country of Denmark. Who does that? That's what he does. Uh, he stands at the NATO conference and when he is caught on, uh, the leaders are caught on tape making fun of him. And by the way, I didn't think it was a big deal. I've heard senators make worse fun of other senators. What does he do? He quits, he leaves right when they're still doing really important business, America doesn't quit. And the last thing I'll say, and maybe that will get to some of our questions, is we must have an optimistic economic agenda for this country. And that means everything from a sensible, practical, but bold plan on healthcare. And I know that matters to all of you uh, when you come back to the States uh, to bring healthcare premiums down, to take on farmer prices. Uh, I'm the one that came out uh, with a big mental health and opioid plan and drug addiction plan. Um, and I think that's really important to do, finally do something when it comes to long-term care, which no one has really dealt with. It's like the elephant in the room. Um, I um, don't quite agree with some of my colleagues on some of their education proposals. I, as I said on the debate stage the other day in Iowa, I don't think they're thinking big enough. I know that's what people don't expect me to say, but I don't. I think you have to match your education system uh, with your economic system. And that means to me things like uh, looking at where our fastest growing jobs are in the medical field and the like, one and two year degrees, uh, making sure that we have a better K through 12 system uh, by funding things more fairly. Um, I could go through the list and I think I'll save it for questions, um, but I am all about a practical uh, but progressive approach. 
and I am the only one on the stage uh, that is in Congress that has passed over 100 bills as a lead Democrat. That is um, one of the major reasons my ability to get things done and unify people and bring them together that showed up in every single part of my life uh, from when I was a county attorney to when I was in the U.S. Senate for 12 years to how I've run my races, why I got the endorsement of the New York Times um, over the last uh, few days. You can look at that along with um, my colleague Elizabeth. Um, as uh, well as the Quad City Times, something you guys may not have noticed abroad, uh, but it is only one of three uh, newspapers in the state of Iowa that endorses it. It's a across Iowa, Illinois uh, border state. So all day when I was getting that endorsement, I said, well, whatever happens with the New York Times, uh, the Quad Cities paper involves four cities. It's actually five. Um, and New York Times is one city. Um, but in any case, it is really an honor to be with all of you and just know that my campaign is, as my friends, um, one of my friends sent me a text with a bad autocorrect that said, congratulations on your insurgency. And she meant surge. And uh, we are um, in just every single day gaining support. I got three new uh, legislative endorsements in Iowa. I now have more endorsements of current electeds and former um, legislators than any other candidate in the race. Uh, we have two of the four uh, top leaders in the New Hampshire House are supporting me, and um, we are going up in the polls um, and are in really an amazing place right now. While I am in um, Washington, and this is hard, um, but uh, it is my constitutional duty, and it's the duty that I embrace um, and will uh, embrace wholeheartedly. I can't be there doing every bus trip in our big green bus and doing 10 events a day like I usually do with four hours sleep, which should be your test that I can handle any crisis and will be able to tune into different time zones in good shape. Um, but the point of it is that um, I'm going to need other people to run with me and run for me. And my last story I'll end with is one of my political mentors, a guy named Paul Wellstone, who's a Minnesota senator who tragically died in a plane crash with his wife. Uh, the last year of his life, he had taken a courageous vote against the Iraq war uh, that I agreed with. And I didn't have an opponent that year, which sounds nice. And I spent the year helping him. And I got to watch as he had told the state that he had MS and he couldn't really run back and forth really fast in the parades like he used to do. Um, he lost a little bit of his uh, zest and energy, but not his spirit. Uh, he's the one that ran campaign ads uh, where he was running against a multimillionaire. So he'd talk really, really fast and he'd say, I have less money than my opponent, so I'm going to say everything in 30 seconds. And that last year, he couldn't uh, run like he used to. And so he would stand on the back of his green bus uh, with his wife, Sheila, at his side, and he would just wave. And the amazing part about the story is that he had energized so many people to run with him and run for him. And there would be hundreds of people running around that bus in these bright green shirts. And I watched it happen. You didn't even notice he wasn't running himself. Uh, so that's what these next two weeks are for me. They're grassroots politics. They're not what I imagined. It looks like we're going to be here night after night after night. Um, but I just have incredible support out there. And this is where it counts. And um, I'm hoping you will consider supporting me and caucusing for me if you can from Iowa, New Hampshire, I don't know, whatever, Nevada, South Carolina, just to name a few, and then heading into Super Tuesday. Um, so Love to, love to hear your questions. Oh, well, thank you so much, Senator. And, you know, um, Paul Wellstone is also, a, we're also big fans of him as well. You oh, know, very good. his quote about um, when we all do better, we all do better. We all do better. It's a great, yeah. it's a great one that's a touchstone for us at Democrats Abroad. So um, our first question is on a topic that we all care very deeply about. Ada, our, um, our chair from um, DA France, she's in Paris. She'll take it, take it first. Go ahead, Ada. Okay. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, um, Senator Klobuchar. Thank uh, you. This, this question comes from both our Hispanic Caucus and also our Progressive Caucus. The climate crisis is a significant contributing factor to many conflicts and refugee situations around the globe, putting Americans abroad and all global citizens at risk due to political insecurity. 
How will you ensure that the U.S. will reduce greenhouse gas emissions below Paris Accord targets and lead the global effort to avoid catastrophic climate breakdown and the global insecurity it would cause? Well, um, this is uh, my top priority, actually. Um, the three things that I want to get done in the first year are immigration reform, climate change, and um, also some of the economic um, challenges that we just talked about um, in terms of climate change. Um, the people running for president, maybe with the ex exception a bit of Senator Sanders, have very similar plans. And I think they're very, very strong plans with money that's in the same neighborhood. I'll leave it at that. And um, the first thing I think we need to do is have immediate action. Uh, we, the days of, oh, is this really happening are gone. They're even gone in the Midwest. I think people actually, you see the polls, you see where people are, they know what's happening. And so on day one, I will get us back into the International Climate Change Agreement. As you're well aware of, uh, there are only two countries that weren't in it when Donald Trump took us out, Nicaragua and Syria. They are now both in the agreement. So we are alone. Um, secondly, the clean power rules that Barack Obama had worked on for years. I was a bit involved in that just because I was in the Senate at the time. And I think many of the electric companies, big and small, are well aware those rules are coming down the pike. Um, and many of them have made preparations. It's just sad they weren't put in uh, right away. But those you can do without Congress. That's what I would do on day three. On day three, bring back the Day two, day three, bring back the gas mileage standards. Uh, right now, California is valiantly trying to get those done, the governor. And um, some of the car companies were still hanging in there. They had originally mostly all supported it. Ford was trying to do it. And literally, Donald Trump's Justice Department threatened them with antitrust violations for trying to put those in place the companies. Um, and so I would put those back in place immediately. And then on day four, five, and six, uh, introduce sweeping legislation to put a price on carbon. On day seven, I would rest. I wouldn't really rest, but I just said that. That is my plan. And the um, I think that the um, legislation, uh, when you look at how we're going to do it, you can put a price on carbon three ways. Uh, you can do it with a straight carbon tax fee, which is actually the most straightforward. I think that's what economists would prefer. You could do it with cap and trade, something I supported uh, when it came to the Senate, but then didn't make it through. Um, and then the third way with a national renewable electricity standard, uh, something that I had actually a bill that I had introduced many, many years ago. So you could also do a combination of them in some way. Whatever we do, it has to bring in the money that's going to uh, create the incentives in a big way uh, to develop renewables to get to uh, carbon neutral and where we want to be. My plan is 45% uh, reduction by 2030 and then by 2050. Um, to get to carbon neutral. Um, the money it'll bring in under my plan is about $2 trillion, And that money literally has to go right back uh, to people who are going to see uh, changes in their heating and their cooling bills. That is the only way we're going to get the votes to get it done. And then, of course, a portion of the money should go to incentives for uh, new jobs in areas that are going to see a transition in their economy. Other, other areas will see more jobs in their economy. Uh, this isn't just from my head, it's from my heart. Uh, when I was growing up, my grandpa worked in the iron ore mines up in northern Minnesota. They would close, they would open, they, they make iron ore that goes to steel. Close open, close open, and literally once they had a billboard outside of Duluth that said, uh, the last one to leave, turn off the lights. They put that up on a billboard. And uh, when you grow up with that, my grandpa lost his job, um, different times in his life. And um, you understand that this isn't just something you can say, oh, we're going to see changes. You actually have to put protections and policies in place. Last thing I'll say is having a candidate from the Midwest lead this fight is ideal uh, because that's where the votes have not been. Uh, the votes um, have been on the coast. Um, part of that is because you see it happening with the hurricanes uh, more quickly with the fires in California, but now we're seeing it big time in the Midwest. Uh, the fires in Colorado and Arizona, not Midwest, but middle of the country West. Uh, the um, Midwest, we're seeing weird weather events, we're seeing homeowners insurance increase, which we're seeing nationally, and we're seeing floods in big time in the last few last year in Missouri and Nebraska and Iowa. Um, the binoculars of a woman named Fran who said, 
look through this, that's my house, bought it with my husband. We lived there with our four-year-olds, wanted to retire in this house, love the kitchen, love the way the light comes in the kitchen. And the house has stood there for nearly a hundred years. There's horse hair in the plaster. Then I say, Fran, where is the kitchen? Looking through the binoculars, she said, oh, um, it's the whole first floor is underwater. And then I said, where's the river? Is this a river? Because there's this road and then there's this the lower road. And, and she said, no, that's, that's not the river. She said, those are all the roads. She said, the river is two and a half miles away. It's never gotten this close before. That is climate change in the middle of the country. And people are seeing it now, farmers who can't plant their crops because it's too wet, um, tornadoes, everything that was predicted by our military and our scientists. So I think making the argument that way is gonna really help us. That's just one example of what I will do uh, to build that coalition and get this done. Thank you so much. Our next question is, um, uh, is about Im immigration and Amanda's going to take that one. Yes, thank you, Julia. And thank you, Senator Klobuchar for being with us today. Uh, this Where are is a you? Question. Oh, I am in Heidelberg, Germany, uh, and I vote in Ohio. Okay. So Midwestern voters. Um, and now this question in particular is around immigration. Uh, and that is that executive orders such as the one exploiting the term public charge demonstrate that our current immigration system was founded in a shameful era of discrimination and bigotry and that family members of Americans abroad are allowed entry to the US through a patchwork of fragile band-aids and weakly defended interpretations. Would you restore the principle of family reunification? How would your plan for immigration improve the situation for spouses, partners, and relatives of Americans living abroad, like us, who wish to return with our families? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have been involved in both immigration efforts that came so close. Um, and of course, family reunification was a major part of both bills. There were debates about how to do it best, um, but the, I couldn't agree more with your description um, of the immigration system right now. I have, um, um, as I've been in the Senate for 12 years, um, I have people in my home office back in Minnesota that deal directly with immigration issues all the time. And the stories are horrific, calls in the middle of the night, um, especially during this administration, um, uh, deporting people who have uh, been here for years simply because they somehow touch the system. So they randomly uh, get chosen uh, to be uh, deported. We've had many cases uh, like that. So. Um, my experience leads me to know something that I hope you will see as positive. We really can get this done. I know where the bodies are. Um, we I look at the past. Bush really wanted to get it done. There's a bunch of Republicans that want to get this done. The chamber supported the last bill we did, as did the AFL-CIO, migrant workers, migrant groups, Farm Bureau, Farmers Union. First effort failed because of really right-wing talk radio, uh, because uh, Bush tried everything to get it done. Um, second effort uh, was actually passed in the US Senate in 2013 when Obama was president with a bunch of Republican votes. I was on the Judiciary Committee then, and on the previous effort, uh, Senator Kennedy actually invited me to be one of two new senators, the other being Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, in a group that worked on it. So I literally know all these issues, and I'm just, I cannot tell you how much I think this can get done. The third thing that happened was actually a smaller effort, but that was when President Trump um, started uh, deporting even people on temporary status in the US. Um, and that was led by a group of senators, including Mike Rounds of South Dakota, who you wouldn't imagine was working on this. But why? Because there's huge employment issues in a state. We worked out an agreement uh, that was just a few years ago, at least on dreamers and temporary status. Uh, we got then gut punched by the administration and it didn't get done. Um, so comprehensive immigration reform, the answer. Uh, economics is so important how we talk about this. Uh, this simple idea that immigrants don't diminish America, they are America, uh, that we have need for workers in our factories, uh, in our fields, starting small businesses, working in our hospitals, every level, 70 of our Fortune 500 companies are headed up by people from other countries. 25% of our US Nobel laureates were born in other countries. Immigrants don't diminish America, they are America. 
Um, and so this idea of having a path to citizenship and having some rules of the road, as you say, that are not patchwork. Um, and my favorite fact, if you bring one fact away from this, besides the 31 counties in Iowa that voted for uh, Donald Trump and Barack Obama, um, is the fact that uh, Grover Norquist, I called him as a friendly witness um, in 2013 on immigration when I was the ranking on the um, Joint Economic Committee. And why? He liked the bill because it brought the debt down by $158 billion, brought the deficit down, $158 billion in 10 years. Because people come out of the shadows and they pay taxes. That money, even if you used a small fraction of it, for some order at the border, not the wall, um, but for help with asylum cases, doing something about the Northern Triangle countries so you don't see um, um, the kind of desperate um, migration uh, that we have seen. Uh, there is so much we could do with good when it comes to immigration. Um, and so I'm actually really excited to work on it. That's fantastic Great. to hear. And um, you know, we are really willing to put the, the force of the American Abroad um, uh, lobbying behind you as well, because it's such an important thing. We are all immigrants. We understand the challenges. And we yeah. want to make sure that uh, other people can have the same benefits that we've been able to enjoy in our countries where we live. Very good. Our next question is about taxation. And it's an important one that um, in the chat box, you'll actually see a lot of uh, questions about it as well. This yeah, is about- I we've seen these little chat chat boxes. All the best to you from Cambridge. Yes, there's people all over the world. There's people on this call from six continents, I believe, yeah. I mean, when we last checked. Okay. And I'm, by the way, I'm based in the Czech Republic. I'm in Prague. Um, uh -huh. and I'm, yeah, I'm a South Carolina. From Singapore. Oh, from we have people all over the world, yeah, literally. Okay, okay. I'll stop reading it. I'll, I'll yes, I know it can be distracting, but um, they are all saying hello. Minnesota thing. Okay, keep going. Yes. Um, so, We've talked to you before about FATCA, and we, you know, we just want to have a specific question to you today about it. Um, basically, regulatory guidance from the Treasury Department could quickly alleviate the harms of FATCA, which are suffered by literally um, every American that's living and working abroad and trying to have a bank account. Would you commit to direct the Treasury Department to study and then implement new guidance that would provide relief to ordinary Americans living abroad who are demonstrably not evading taxes we just want to have bank accounts and be able to invest um, literally in our countries where we live. Yeah, and you know, I am a supporter of that bill as I think others that are running for president are. Uh, and um, I was there, it was during uh, Barack Obama's time that we actually uh, got that bill done. Uh, but I am of course open to working with you on finding out uh, what issues are that we could make better in how it is implemented. Um, and um, I think there's just so many issues with our tax system um, that could be uh, made better. Uh, there's not enough people uh, working there, just as other, uh, to quote Ambassador Ivanovich, someone who I know personally and big fan of, um, um, uh, the State Department has been hollowed out. Uh, those are her words, but so have so many of our other government agencies. Um, and that makes it harder to do things like be creative and smart about how we enforce laws, um, especially in the tax area. Um, and so um, that's one of the things that just when I look back at all of the taking on hard problems takes uh, time and it takes uh, an agency that is well organized. And one of the problems is because under the Trump era, uh, it is so chaotic with the you know, government's focus changing every day when the president sends out a tweet in his bathrobe at 4 a.m. Um, that it makes it really hard to tackle those kinds of problems. And so that is something that um, I'm committed to do, which is really putting people in place so we can step back and look at all kinds of implementation issues. Uh, because that's not the glamorous work of government, uh, but it's the important work of government if you want to have people's backs. Oh, we really appreciate that. And it's also incredibly impactful work. So um, mm -hmm. that, that it's just really important. Um, we have one uh, follow-up question. Amanda, would you like to take that? Yeah, 
Thank you. Um, and just building off of that, uh, as a follow-up, most Americans living abroad think that the time has come for residency-based taxation, the principal guiding all other countries' tax systems, and a fix for numerous unjust burdens on Americans living and working abroad. Now, there are bipartisan revenue-neutral proposals to implement RBT that include robust provisions to protect the laws from abuse by tax evaders. All we need is a moment of leadership to get this done. Will you be that leader? <laughs> well, I have uh, not taken a position to change that at this time. I'm always open to looking at things. Um, and if I could just step back um, on our taxes in general, um, there uh, just has not been the opportunity to step back and look at our tax code to see what works for regular people. Uh, because when you think about it, when President Obama was in, uh, we did some things, but we were in a deep uh, recession and it was hard to make the changes that need to be made. Uh, then uh, President Trump comes in and they pass his uh, tax bill, uh, which really uh, weighted, was weighted toward people at the top and has added over a trillion dollars in debt. Um, and when you look at his time period, while well, he gloats about what things, what's happening in our country, we've had a 30% over the last decade, even before him, uh, a slowdown in startups. We call it the startup slump because of consolidations and other things. And we just don't have uh, good tax enforcement, as I already mentioned. And then there's just a bunch of things I think that we need to change when it comes to our tax code, uh, including uh, closing some loopholes and uh, doing something about the buffer rule and um, uh, bringing in reversing some of the corporate tax cuts he made. I was in the group that wanted to bring the corporate tax rate down, uh, but not to the level, near the level that he brought it to. Every point he went down was a hundred billion. And I would actually take um, a big chunk of that money and put it into infrastructure, another ch chunk to start working on uh, the deficit, which he has um, uh, brought to record levels. Um, and I just think there's much more we have to do to keep our economy strong for the long term. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Our next question is about health care. Ada, would you like to take that one? Um, yes, thank you. Um, Senator, in a 2019 survey of Americans living abroad, Democrats abroad found that many of our members cited their reason for living abroad as affordable health care. These numbers include health care refugees who cannot afford to return to live in the United States due to the high cost of health care and the threat of bankruptcy due to illness. Under your health care plan, will Americans currently abroad at all income levels and in all states of health be able to return to live in the United States and to receive quality, affordable, accessible health care for them and their families at a reasonable cost and without threat of bankruptcy? Yes. Um, I, of course, worked on the Affordable Care Act. And I always like to remind people, let's start practically. Uh, that is that the Affordable Care Act is now 10 points more popular than the President of the United States. And some of my colleagues, um, 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 in my mind, um, have plans that are not realistic uh, when you have, for instance, Senator Sanders plan. Um, while certainly worth debating, and we have more than debated it, um, uh, doesn't even have two thirds of the U.S. senators, Democratic senators, on that bill, um, and that's because of the some of the systematic issues that would arise with that bill, including kicking 149 million Americans off their current health insurance in four years. Um, so my plan is really building off what Barack Obama wanted to do from the beginning. That is a nonprofit public option that would immediately. Uh, make 12 million people um, eligible for um, health care um, that aren't eligible now. It would bring down premiums for 13 million, and this is according to a well established study on the nonprofit public option. Um, and there's other things we can do on the way cost sharing that has some um, Republican support, actually, um, and um, other measures we can take to stop the sabotage that we've seen. Uh, from the Trump administration of the Affordable Care Act. Next slide is going after pharmaceuticals prices. Um, it's nearly 20% of our health care costs when you include 
a hospital pharmaceuticals. I have led those efforts since I got to the Senate on uh, lifting the ban on negotiating better prices under Medicare, on bringing in less expensive drugs from other countries. In Minnesota, we can see Canada from our porch. And so I'm well aware of the prices over there. Uh, Bernie and I actually had an amendment to gather at one night late at midnight or so, and 14 senators voted for it. Republicans voted for it, 14 Republicans. They might have been too tired, but of course that didn't mean they voted with us last night on the evidence issues. But um, putting a cap on tied to the international rate, the rates that you see often um, for pharmaceuticals. And that's a bill over the house, uh, $350 billion, $350 billion would bring in on the deficit. Can you imagine $350 billion for taxpayers that could be used for healthcare or other things. Next, um, addiction and mental health. One in five Americans suffer from mental health, and um, yet we have problems of insurance not covering mental health. Um, we also have issues of, especially in rural areas, not being able to get coverage at all. Um, there's going to be a huge settlement coming in on opioids, kind of like the tobacco settlement, and we want to make sure that that money goes to people that need it. And uh, by the way, some of it should also go to mental health and to alcoholism, meth, crack cocaine, which is still hitting our minority communities in a big way. Um, for me, this is personal. This is why I was the first one to come out with a big plan on this. Uh, my dad uh, struggled with alcoholism my whole life growing up. Uh, by the time I got married, he had three DWIs, and that's when the judge said, you got to choose treatment or jail. He chose treatment, and in his words, he was pursued by grace. It changed his life, and uh, he was been sober. He's now 91 in assisted living, and in his words, it's hard to get a drink around here anyway. Uh, but that's his life, and I think everyone should have that same right. And the final thing which you should care about is long-term care, even if you're not a senior. A lot of people have aging parents and maybe kids themselves or struggling with aging parents. That means strong Medicaid, strong Social Security, and it means putting in incentives like for long-term care insurance and making it easier for people to live at home. Um, and um, I've actually brought this up a number of times on the debate stage because um, I think that the fact that Donald Trump's not dealing with this because uh, he's off trying to relitigate literally in Texas uh, the Affordable Care Act um, is just really a travesty when you look at the doubling of our senior population. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that answer. Um, our last question today is about voter protection. Um, and this is an issue that we all carry very much about as we are, you know, we, we have to go so many extra steps to send our ballots back and request our ballots every calendar year we want to vote. So, you know, federal legislation provides some protection for overseas voters, but the legislation does not go far enough to counter the challenges that states and even, uh, and recently, especially the Trump administration, have set up to limit voting from abroad. 67% of, of abroad ballots are returned by mail were required to be returned by mail, largely due to state requirements, yet postal delivery of ballots is really fraught with problems. And during each election, thousands of ballots do not arrive on time to be counted. How will you help protect the rights of Americans abroad to vote while helping ensure that states, um, uh, helping states ensure that ballots are returned safely? Um, sure, well, um, the Trump administration has actually uh, backtracked on the postal union issue and making sure that we have an international system um, that works for people to get their ballots in. Um, and I would, I would be the opposite on that. Uh, I think the vote to write is fundamental. And I think you see that in my record. I lead most of the major bills on uh, voting. And um, that includes um, election security, the backup paper ballot bill and the audit bill, several versions, one of them bipartisan that we were literally getting heading to the floor for a vote and again got got punched by Mitch McConnell and the uh, administration, even though I had Lindsey Graham on the bill and uh, Richard Burr on the bill um, with my lead James Langford and along with Senator Harris and Warner and others. Um, and so uh, that's number one. Uh, and I'm very concerned about what's going to happen with hacking if we don't take some measures to take to do something about it. Number two, voting. Um, so many things that have developed since the US Supreme Court overturned the uh, Shelby or overturned parts of the Voting Rights Act with the Shelby decision. And there, uh, we must reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. 
um, as president, I would uh, work to get my bill done, which would uh, automatically register every kid to uh, vote, including our citizens living abroad, uh, when they turn 18. Uh, if we can all get a social security number, we should be able to do this. If we can all, uh, you know, Target can find a pair of shoes in uh, Hawaii with a SKU number, uh, we should be able to get this done. Um, voting purges, which is something else they've instituted uh, with the reversals on the Voting Rights Act. Um, I, I, my friend Stacey Abrams, who should be the governor of Georgia right now, she's the one that said, you know, you don't lose your right to worship just because you don't go to temple or church or to uh, the mosque um, for a few months or a few years. You don't right, lose your right to assemble just because you're not on a video conference call like this or show up at a meeting. And you shouldn't be losing your right to vote just because you haven't voted for a few years and then you get purged from a list and you show up on election day and it doesn't let you vote. Um, that's what we're talking about. So I have a bill right now with Sherrod Brown, uh, speaking of Ohio, uh, to uh, change that. And as president, I would really be in a position to be a democracy president. Everything in my record uh, from being someone that's run with no money and wants to uh, made uh, the uh, overturn of Citizens United with a constitutional amendment, uh, one of my uh, major proposals would lead you to believe this. I come from a humble background. I'm the granddaughter of an iron ore miner who worked 1500 feet underground, saved money in a coffee can, uh, he did with my grandma to send my dad to a two-year community college. Um, by the way, they were Slovenian immigrants on uh, my uh, dad's side. Uh, my mom, who was the daughter of Swiss immigrants, um, and my, both of them coming over from Switzerland and grew up with no money. Um, Cliché-wise, my great-grandmother was a cheesemaker um, in Wisconsin, um, but she taught second grade until she was 70 years old. So I'm literally before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner and the uh, daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Minnesota and a candidate for president. That's about shared dreams. That's about a democracy that works where you can run for office uh, with literally no connections um, and uh, no one can hardly pronounce your last name um, because it's Slovenian um, and uh, get to the point uh, where I am. And by the way, people couldn't deal with Barack Obama's name at the beginning either. Um, and I just think we have to remember that core of our democracy and for getting this done, it's not just about fired up Democrats. It is really also that issue of democracy um, is a libertarian issue for a lot of people. And you can bring in independents and moderate Republicans with this argument that we shouldn't mute people's voices. We shouldn't shut out people's voices. To come around to the beginning, that's why 70% of Americans or 69% um, believe it's wrong to not have witnesses in this impeachment trial. People still believe that the law matters. Uh, and as I said at the debate stage, if the Republicans want to mess around with us, really on democracy or on the rule of law, they should just give the uh, president a crown and a scepter and, you know, announce that he's king. Our country was founded because we didn't want to be ruled by a monarchy, uh, because we wanted our independence, uh, because we wanted our democracy. So um, I really think this democracy issue is not just um, core to everything we want to get done. Uh, it is also a way to bring people with us. Well, Senator Klobuchar, thank you so much for joining us today. We really sure. appreciate you taking the time to dig sure. into a few of the questions that we deeply care about. and. We just send you all the best of luck as you go back to the floor today. Well, thank um, you. And uh, let me know I am the ranking on the Senate Rules Committee. Um, and so, you know, feel free to uh, talk to us about any voting issues because we will. Uh, I really, it is, um, and that's the committee that has jurisdiction over that. And then my last pitch is I would love for the support of your members. Um, and no one works harder. And I think when you look at those newspaper endorsements we just got, which um, maybe some people were surprised by, uh, but I wasn't because I just work hard and I bring people with me and win elections big time. And we do not want to eke by an election at four in the morning or later, even with your great mail-in ballots um, uh, from abroad. Uh, we want to win this big time because if we want to move on gun safety or 
uh, if we want to move on. Um, I got distracted because I just saw someone from Switzerland. Hello. <laughs> uh, if we want to move on gun safety, um, if we want to move on environment, and climate change, and immigration reform, and health care, all the issues we talked about today, then we've got to win big. We've got to send Mitch McConnell packing and win the U.S. Senate. And that is a coalition that I build in all my elections. Well, that's wonderful. And we're working really hard to do that as well. We're, we're right you. there with you. Um, Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, um, one thing I just want to remind everyone on the call, we really encourage you all to vote in our global presidential primary this year. Your vote will be four times more impactful for your candidate than if you vote in your state. Um, due to the number of voters determining who our, our delegates are um, and who they will support in the national convention. Amanda, would you like to wrap up the call today? Sure, thanks, Julia. And thank you so much to fellow Slovenian and Senator <laughs> Amy Klobuchar. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed the call as much as I did. Your support goes a long way. Please visit www.democratsabroad.org slash donate so that we can continue to bring events like these to Americans around the world. We'd also love your support as a volunteer. It's all hands on deck starting now. So sign up at www.democratsabroad.org slash volunteer to get involved. New and first time volunteers are more than welcome. With that, we're going to be ending the call. Thanks again to Senator Klobuchar and to all of you for joining today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much.